Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Dr. Lori Nadell, and she's here to share with us her new book, The Five Gifts, Discovering Hope, Healing, and Strength When Disaster Strikes. Now, Dr. Lori is a psychologist, journalist, and best-selling author who specializes in helping people recover from trauma. In Long Beach, New York, she runs a support group at City Hall for people who are traumatized by losing their homes to Hurricane Sandy. At Metropolitan Communication Associates in Manhattan, she works with patients who have had traumatic brain injuries due to assault, rape, MS, and stroke. During 2003 and 2005, she directed a program for teenagers whose fathers were killed on 9-11. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Lori Nadell. Hey, thank you so much for having me as your guest. I really appreciate it. You know, what an honor it is to have you here with us today and your book, The Five Gifts. I mean, once I picked it up, I mean, your book grabbed me. I could not put it down. I mean, it is a page turner. Oh, well, thank you. That's a, that's a great, uh, great compliment for, uh, for any writer. Um, I, I say to people, you know, sit in a room for a year and you write and then, you know, you, you send the book off to the publisher and then you wonder, is anybody ever going to read it? You know, is it, is it going to move people? Is it any good? So I'm, I'm deeply grateful that, uh, you find it, uh, well written and easy to read. Wow. Well, it, It's making a huge impact. It's easy to see why the book is getting such great reviews and why people are flocking to this book because it's exactly, in many ways, kind of unfortunately, but it's exactly what we need right now because people, you know, they get to this point where tragedy strikes and it's like, okay, now now what do I do? You know, now, now how do I feel? Well, people feel confused because, you know, these are turbulent times. And we've lived, um, as, as one of my friends in England said, you know, you, we've never had a, a war on our territory. I mean, we have had terrorist incidents, but uh, we haven't experienced uh, you know, long periods of hardship and adversity in our lifetimes. And uh, I think that right now the, the cycle of turbulence is kicking up so much uh, uncertainty and instability that we really need to learn from other countries and other cultures uh, what kind of values, what kind of thinking do we need uh, in order to be able to accept the unacceptable or, or accept what, we, what, what has uh, been traditionally not part of our experience. And we can incorporate these, these uh, new ways of thinking or these values or beliefs so that we can stay balanced when things really start to become very unsteady, which they are right now. Yeah. Well, the book, The Five Gifts, starts really with your story and what you have gone through. And it, you, you write in such a vivid way that I personally felt like I was sharing this experience for you. So for people who maybe haven't gone through, let's say, you know, having um, your home flooded, you know, like as you discussed, I mean, it, it's a real, it, it's kind of jarring in some ways just to see what the expectation level is. Right. It, it's, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we keep, we, you know, be, because of various reasons, whether I say whether you call it climate change or an act of God, you know, we're in a very turbulent uh, climate cycle of, of extreme weather and cli- mm-hmm. changes to the baseline temperature and stability in the climate. I guess I would, I kind of want to phrase it that way, uh, cause climate change is kind of a buzzword. And whether or not you believe, quote unquote, in climate change, um, the, the evidence is here that, that we're, we're in a cycle of increasing turbulence and, uh, and stability in, uh, from the wildfires in California to hurricanes and blizzards and tornadoes increasing. And that's just in our country that we're familiar with, but it's also happening in Europe and it's happening in South America and it's happening in Asia. Um, you know, this is a, this is a, a global situation that's affecting people all over the, all over the world. In this country, uh, for, um, for various reasons that we, we don't understand yet, 
uh, we're seeing an increase in what we call intentional disasters, and these are the uh, these horrible, um, you know, human to human attacks, whether they're shootings or attempted bombings or. Um, even September 11th would be considered an intentional disaster where one human is trying to do as much damage to as many people as possible. And we're seeing an increase in, in that, uh, in that kind of violence as well. And when we, when we live through that, or even if we witness it indirectly on television, we're deeply affected by this. You know, there's such a thing as vicarious or, or secondary trauma. And if we spend hours and hours watching images of, of, that are violent, um, it will cause us to feel un, unsettled and afraid. So the anxiety levels, you know, research shows that our anxiety levels are way up over even a year ago. And so the, I wrote the book to basically help people to uh, see that there are things that they can do to, um, to help to take the edge off the sense of helplessness and panic. Well, and, and it does such a great job with that. It also explains, you know, what, you know, some of the society's norm as far as expectation for us. Like when someone goes through a tragedy, you know, it talks about that three-month period that um, society, you know, kind of expects for you to, okay, now you've gone through this it's three months, you should be back at it, you know, should be working away or, you know, getting back to normal. Right. Well, there's a there's a health cycle, and the health cycle uh, normally lasts two to three months, and that's when you know people experience that kind of outpouring of empathy, and you know rescue workers come in, and volunteers come in, and the American Red Cross, um, and other organizations and churches send uh, volunteers, disaster mental health workers come in, you know, to help people with the immediate shock. And then, you know, they get called away either because, um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the time that they fit, they finished the assignment or because, uh, they've been called away. If we, we saw this, this, uh, this summer we had, uh, Hurricane Florence, which is a mega disaster in North Carolina. And then less than a month later, uh, Hurricane Michael and a lot of the FEMA people, the search and rescue people, the insurance adjusters got reassigned from Florence to uh, Pensacola, Florida, and Hurricane Michael area. And uh, so you see that people in the first tragedy are abandoned and, you know, they're, they're no, their needs are no longer being addressed fully. And so they still have to make survival decisions in shock. But uh, they they find that they've been more or less abandoned, and they have to navigate through both the financial terrain and the legal terrain and the psychological terrain, um, which, which is completely unknown to to most of us until until we have to deal with it. And you know the the support that you thought would be there, based on you know the outpouring of of. Uh, goodwill and, and empathy and assistance that comes with the first two or three months, suddenly uh, people's attention is diverted. And, you know, you, you and, I, and I've heard this from people in a number of different places, like after a few months, uh, people who are just starting to process uh, the nature of what happened are, are feel that they feel that they're abandoned. You know, they're abandoned by the media. They're no longer, you know, front and center in terms of uh, publicity and public attention. And um, they still have a long road ahead. So that's another reason why I wrote the book because the 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 process of healing emotionally, the process of recovering, so that the uh, event or the tragedy doesn't dominate your thoughts from the moment you wake up. It takes a few years. It can take three to five years to, uh, we call it, metabolize or digest the unthinkable. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm so glad that you wrote this book, The Five Gifts, because a lot of times, I mean, people just don't know how long this takes. And there's this expectation that, you know, it's people will, you know, get through this, it'll happen quickly. And you're right. I mean, by the time one tragedy happens, we've got these, you know, ones that just kind of back to back to back, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard for people to really focus in on what's happening, let's say with, with people in, in, uh, in California with the wildfires while they're, you know, also look, you know, looking at hurricanes that have been happening. Right. 
And then, you know, uh, there are also, as I said, the human uh, disasters, which don't follow any kind of a, a, a pattern or cycle whatsoever. But they can, eru- you know, they, they seem to erupt, you know, at any time. And, uh, and, and they do divert a lot of attention away from, you know, the, the what do you call it, the, the current or the pre-existing disaster, the, the fire or the natural disaster. Um, it, it gets kind of upstaged by the, uh, the, the newest incident, especially, you know, if, if it's, uh, it's a mass shooting or, you know, something horrendous that involves loss of life. Uh, that's deliberate. And one of the things about a natural disaster is that you know it's 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 an act of nature. It's an act of God. It's kind of random. You know, it's unpredictable. You know, your house might get flooded. Your next door neighbor might not take on any water. Uh, this this happens all the time. And you talk to people who uh, have uh, experienced loss during a hurricane. Well, I lost everything, but my neighbor just had an inch of water in her garage. And um, you know, so so. You we talk about say the process of forgiving it's kind of easier to forgive the weather than it is to forgive uh, a human being who deliberately uh, walked into a place and started shooting or who threw a, a bomb or tried to blow himself up or herself up in a public space so um, you know the emotional process is a little bit different but um, you know we, we're just bombarded with these and I, I would like to say that, you know, I worked in a newsroom for 20 years. I worked in different newsrooms. The last decade of my career was spent at CBS News. And it really struck me one day as I was looking at all these monitors that had uh, footage coming in. And this, this, this was, I don't know, 20 years. I call it the BI era before Internet. So a newsroom was really a nerve center. And you'd, you'd look at these satellite feeds coming in and you'd see, you know, bombing in Beirut, and you'd see a building collapse in India, and you'd see a construction accident in Chicago, and a plane accident over here, and and you would just keep looking at all of the, you know, that we call them hard news events, but they're uh, really, you know, one disaster after another after another. And as you're looking, as I was looking at all of them, um, I, I really was struck by how much suffering that that there was, and began to recognize that there would really be a need for people to uh, have support so they could recover from these life-shattering events. Uh, I used to uh, kind of started to come up organically after, after I had a baby that these were real people and that the, their lives were never going to be the same. And I think we forget that because we, we get numb to seeing these images uh, as soon as you turn on your cell phone or your tablet or your your computer or your television you know this this is something that greets us every morning and and people are kind of numb to it and so when it happens to you you can't swipe it away you know you can't change the channel and you don't know what to do and that yeah. really led me to write the book is that what led you to, um, in many ways, like your career change as well? You know, because, I mean, you're, you, you've been working with people for quite some time now that um, have gone through different tragedies. Yes, I, I, it was kind of an organic process uh, to, to uh, although to take like four or five years uh, to get my degrees through independent study after I, I left the news business. But I, I really saw it as a as a transition of wanting to be useful um, after years of, of kind of just writing and producing uh, hard news, uh, which which are these you know thirty second to one minute clips that you see you know videos that you see on on TV or um, you know on Yahoo News or wherever you get your news source uh, to want to be able to make some kind of contribution to healing. Uh, especially to help people who had who had suffered something that was sudden and unexpected, and uh, which, which altered their life in some significant way. Yeah, I mean, and, and most people don't realize. I mean, these clips that um, a lot of times that producers are reviewing and and editing. I mean, there's a lot in there that gets edited out, so that way it's it's appropriate for TV. So you know. The person that's doing this work has seen a lot of this trauma, and it, it could be really difficult. You know, I I think that um, when I started, 
I was I, I really would have nightmares at night about the images of Vietnam and the images of Biafra, the Biafran War back in the 60s. And I, I would actually have dreams about the outtakes, you know, the, the film that physically ended up on the cutting room floor. And uh, it, it really bothered me. And I thought I was probably too sensitive for, for TV news. And then over time... You, know, you develop uh, you develop certain professional skills and you learn how to detach sufficiently to be able to um, look at look at the images of suffering and, and be able to um, you know do your work in a nice clean way to present information and not to sensationalize at least in those days that those were the goals and uh, and over time I found that accumulatively, uh, after say 15 years, it really did start to affect me on a on more of a gut level. Yeah, I mean, I think it would do that for anybody. I know in your book you talk about um, being able to, you know, kind of um, view these situations as a first responder would, so it just doesn't eat at your core. You know, first responders have to deal with these uh, life and death uh, situations, a very disturbing scenes, uh, some of which uh, are quite graphic, I know, in uh, my chapter three, which talks about, you know, how first responders cope with um, kind of life and death, uh, uh, injured, wounded, um, you know, strange accidents and um, really very harsh uh, scenarios that they have to deal with on a day-by-day basis, Uh, especially when a kid dies, that's extremely difficult for a young firefighter or a paramedic or a police officer uh, to be able to process because they usually have their own families at home. And so there is a movement among the first responder community uh, called the Critical Incident Stress Foundation or CISM, uh, Critical Incident Stress Management Movement, which has been um, creating a a safe process, uh, a confidential process for first responders to debrief and to talk about their reactions immediately after uh, an event that they found disturbing. Like, for example, um, as I said, when a, when a child dies or uh, an event like any kind of a mass shooting where uh, the first responders are going to be looking at um, you know, dead bodies or, or you know, innocent people uh, wounded or, or suffering um, and they're going to be experiencing also what the crowd is going through, what the witnesses are going through. These are highly charged events. And one of the great, I guess, blessings or gifts of the critical incident stress management movement from my, my perspective as a clinician is that it, uh, it provides an available way for professionals to be able to talk about what they see, what they hear, what they sense, what they perceive, um, without any kind of judgment, you know, without being judged, um, and with the understanding that, you know, it's human to be upset. You know, it doesn't make you less professional. It's human to be disturbed when you see, um, you know, acts of violence or you, you go in uh, after a disaster like the campfires and you're picking up, uh, you know, picking up the wounded and the dead. Um, it, it is upsetting. It's graphic and there's nothing wrong with admitting that you find it uh, deeply disturbing. Um, as one uh, one firefighter said, you know, sometimes um, it it stays with you in ways that you don't expect. Yeah. You know, um, and that kind of um, brings me to a point in your book, The Five Gifts, you talk about some very disturbing trends that are taking place. And I was really shocked by the statistics when you were um, pulling that information for your book, was that surprising to you as well? I mean, there's one that, that I keep returning to, which is a uh, study by the National Wildlife uh, uh, Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's by 2025, or that's just, what, seven years from now, more than 200 million Americans will experience some kind of mental health uh, damage due to um, natural disasters that are increasing in frequency and intensity. 
So that means an increase in depression, anxiety, substance abuse, PTSD, as we're seeing in Puerto Rico, even suicide rates are, are soaring. Um, there, there have also been studies by the National Institutes of Health that show the long-term health effects of uh, being under acute stress after any kind of disaster or, or combat or um, any any kind of uh, you know, violence, especially in a, in, a, in a cycle of violence, that 20 to 30 years from now people can begin to experience um, you know, heart problems, gastrointestinal problems, um, you know, high blood pressure, hypertension, um, cardiac issues, um, diabetes, anything with an itis, anything that's got an inflammatory aspect to it can, uh, can come up later on and be directly, apparently, according to the research, directly connected to the stress levels in the body that we experience as a result of going through uh, catastrophic events. And so there, there's a mental health piece where I really think that where we already have a public health epidemic of uh, acute stress, uh, which are the first three months after these events, and the, the long-term kind of chronic, what we call post-traumatic stress, and the, the other things that stem from that, as I said, which can include substance abuse, severe depression, um, an increase in suicide, and... Um, you know, just kind of a, a failure to thrive. And, uh, you know, as as 200 million people, as we approach that particular number, that's a population the size of Texas. And if that's not a public health epidemic, I don't know what is. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, and it's interesting, you and I were talking a little bit before um, our discussion here in regards to just how many people have been touched by some sort of tragedy, either it's natural, man-made, you know, we all know somebody who has either been affected or has passed or has gone through a tragedy that has happened. And we look at this, you know, just and how this affects um, people that, the, the population and the people that we are here. And it's not like not happening in my neighborhood anymore. I mean, it's right. happening really to each and every one of us. And it's also not happening to them as in, you know, on the other side of the world. I mean, it, it used mm-hmm. to be, you know, when when, uh, when I was working, you know, in the newsroom, say in the 70s and 1980s or even the 1960s, you know, a lot of these really severe events were happening um, in other countries. And, you know, it was, there, was a, there was a kind of geographic distance. It took the film maybe two days to get to New York or London. So there was always kind of a time delay in how you thought about what you were seeing. But now uh, with, with, you know, satellite technology and digital access, I mean, we can see things happening in real time. And that itself has kind of changed the way we, we look at ourselves globally. And it's also changed the way I think we perceive time and space because there's an immediacy to each and every one of these events. There's a, an urgency that, that gives us a feeling that what happened to that person could happen to any one of us. And I think that's, that's the thing that um, kind of stays with me uh, or has stayed with me in working with people over the last 30 years is the realization that, you know, it doesn't just happen over there, that anything that happened to you could happen to me. Uh, and, and you are kind of uh, a very good example of somebody who's been involved in people that have gone through tragedy. I know you were working with uh, teens after um, September 11th and just helping them to connect. That's right. Um, teenagers, um, and, and I, I say this, you know, with all due respect to every everyone involved uh, in, in the uh, – um, never again movement, but many teenagers don't like to grieve in public. Um, you know, if you have a teenager, if you live with a teenager, you know, they they don't want to be seen as different or special. Um, they're more likely to isolate at a certain point and, you know, close the door and not want to talk about it. And uh, after September 11th, uh, there were quite a few kids who wouldn't speak about it at home. And I think when I started the program, it was uh, actually two years after 9-11, 
and uh, some of those kids had never spoken about it uh, with their moms at all. And so what I did was, uh, was I, I hope that I did, was to create um, activities and events where they could connect with each other and they could look at each other and they could be there for each other. The, uh, a lot of our activities revolved around sports, so we were together through three baseball seasons and um, eventually the, the older boys started coaching the younger boys in baseball because the, the younger kids no longer had their dads to help coach them after school for Little League. And so there was something very beautiful about the uh, bonding uh, and connection that, that grew up naturally just by giving these kids uh, safe opportunities to, to be together with each other. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Dr. Lori Nadell on her new book, The Five Gifts. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and souls. to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with Dr. Lori Nadell, and she's sharing with us her new book, The Five Gifts, Discovering Hope, Healing, and Strength When Disaster Strikes. Dr. Lori, in your book, there's a section that talks about how you were able to make these connections with the children whose fathers had passed away during 9-11. You talk about how the process was very organic and it was really difficult for people to connect with these children. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it was funny, when I was hired, they'd already tried. Uh, my the World Trade WTC Family Center had uh, hired, you know, experts and, you know, academics and people with you know, kind of more formal clinical experience in um, adolescent bereavement. and uh, And everybody had kind of struck out. And so... 
my boss kind of he said he was skeptical that I would be able to reach these. Nobody, nobody seems to be able to reach these kids. But I was a single mom, and I had actually, you know, kind of been raising a teenager, so I kind of felt like I'd survived, you know, as a single mom, and understood a little bit about how uh, teenagers, um, what what they need actually, and what's important to them. Um, and and I was also able to connect with the moms because if you think about it, you know, the morning of September 11th, um, you know, husbands went to work and and the kids had a father, and then by the end of the day, you know, the, these these women were widows and single mothers, like all of a sudden, and you know they, they had no time to prepare, and you know, being a, a parent to a teenager, whether you're um, whether you're co-parenting or whether you're on your own, I mean. You know, raising teenagers is a white knuckle ride at the best of times. You know, they're, they're, teenagers are wonderful. I, I love being with teenagers, but they're, they're unpredictable and, uh, they don't necessarily, uh, want to open up about what's, what their, what's going on inside their own private world. And so it, uh, it really was very moving, uh, to see the kids come together with each other. Mm, what a beautiful, it really is a, a beautiful story in your book, and there are many others that are difficult to read and heart wrenching. And that what I really appreciate about your book is you also have, um, I think it provides great hope for people that are looking to, you know, kind of get beyond what what pains they've been through. Because I mean, it's we get to this point with where we're kind of like, okay, I've been through this tragedy. Now what? Now what do I do? Well, you know, it's it's not it's not an you know it was, certainly wasn't an easy book to write, but it's definitely yeah, I know it's not an easy book to read. I mean, it's not light reading. Uh, yet it was my it was my intention. I had speaking to people who had come through um, you know unspeakable tragedies, and I just find it's interesting because we we watch these things, we watch these events and these stories and the aftermath and the news and. You think about something as massive as the Rwandan genocide, where millions of people were were massacred with machetes, you know, in a in like a two month period. And how do people get through something like that? But yet, the people of Rwanda have really uh, spearheaded and pioneered one of the great reconciliation movements in the world. And we can learn from uh, how they have come together to heal or South Africa, where they went through decades of the most brutal repression, dictatorship, and apartheid. And yet, you know, we have these great leaders, of Nelson Mandela and uh, Bishop Tutu, who, uh, again, were uh, world leaders in uh, the, the movement to learn how to forgive those who were our oppressors. And I just think that there's so much that we can learn from uh, people in other countries, whether it's people in Europe who had to had to start over again psychologically after the Second World War, or people who escaped from repressive regimes in uh, communist the communist regimes. I have a couple of stories of people who um, escaped from the Soviet Union in, e- in East Germany, or indigenous people who have been living with uh, centuries of oppression. And, uh, and, and poverty and discrimination. And we have so much to learn, uh, that's inspiring from people who have had to, have had to develop a mindset that allows them to get through adversity and hardship without feeling like victims. I think that that's what I hope is the most hopeful message of the five gifts, that we're survivors. We're, we're not victims. Um, it, it wasn't our fault. We couldn't prevent what happened, but uh, we we can learn, we can grow, we can we can emerge, um, as Ernest Hemingway said, uh, stronger in the broken places. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt, you know it's it, it's interesting when you share your own story. You talk about you know what you went through, and there was a point where the worry just kind of faded away, and everything just clicked. For you in, in a spiritual way, you just you're like, okay, whatever it's going to be is going to be, and you went with it. And it's it's interesting. Was it at that point that you were able to develop what the five gifts are, or is that something that came over time? Well, the, the five gifts came to me uh, while I was meditating. Um, 
And, you know, the, the first few months, uh, I'm talking to people in California, um, and, you know, the, the, the shock of dealing with a, a very um, impersonal and insensitive and sometimes um, dishonest uh, broken system uh, the insurance system, you know, the insurance uh, uh, industry, if you will, uh, the government, uh, the bank that holds your mortgage that seizes your insurance settlement check and puts it in escrow and, um, you know, dealing with uh, contractors and builders who come in uh, sometimes uh, not always reputable, not always honest. Um, so you have to make these survival decisions and navigate this minefield while you're in shock. And these things that you would never... In, a, in your whole life, you could, would not imagine some of the things that could happen, which really threaten your financial survival. It can threaten everything that you've built for yourself. It can threaten your ability to rebuild and come back. A lot of people end up walking away. They just give up their property. They give up their homes. They give up their lives because they just can't deal with the abusiveness or the, the, um, the kind of harrowing experience of having to fight uh, for every every dollar that they're entitled to, and it was during one of these you know particularly chaotic, difficult periods that um, I, I kind of looked at myself and I thought, well, if you were your own patient or your own client, what would you suggest? And you know, it was in that moment I realized that it's very hard to live your own advice. But I thought I would say to somebody, you know, please, you know, hit the pause button for 48 hours and. You know, don't deal with anything related to this disaster. Don't answer the phone. Don't do any emails. Just do whatever you need to rest and regroup. And um, and that's what I did. And while I was uh, meditating, I think on the second day, I was finally calm enough. My mind was clear enough. And uh, I sat there kind of mindfully and quietly. And I heard uh, my inner voice or an inner voice whisper uh, five words, which were humility, patience, empathy, forgiveness, and growth. And um, I've been meditating a long time, and I've had been very fortunate in having um, uh, many um, examples of uh, kind of intuitive insight or, you know, spiritual uh, flashes, if you will, of, of, uh, of advice or guidance that I couldn't have come up with myself with my own conscious mind or certainly not my logical mind uh, couldn't have come up with these things and um, and it was very calming you know I heard those five words and I was kind of guided to write them down and I was told that these 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 five these were five gifts that would help me to get through and would help me to help other people get through this disaster this was literally a disaster and was becoming worse you know every week it was it was becoming more and more threatening financially and economically and you know physically uh, debilitating to every everybody and um, so through the five gifts I was able to kind of start uh, working with people and the I had two support programs running for people in my community one was in city hall the other one was at a church and uh, the five gifts were very helpful in uh, helping people to feel calm and and a little bit safer while navigating you know this kind of horrible uh, field of uh, you know treachery and and you know financial uh, financial upheaval that we all found mm-hmm. ourselves in for a very long period of time. I mean, this is still going on after Hurricane Sandy. I mean, there were still you know of a million people who lost their homes in Hurricane Sandy. There are still thousands who uh, are either uh, they're facing uh, they never they never got the money to fix their house or they had to they had to walk away from their house or they had to file for bankruptcy i mean the the socioeconomic fallout from a natural disaster is something that i write about um in, in a chapter called financial trauma that uh, we see it in puerto rico you know we're going to hear about it in uh, pensacola you're going to be hearing about it in california even in wealthy communities like malibu uh, the the financial aspect of of the loss uh, has a ripple effect that that impacts all areas of your life, and you know it's yeah. not because of the amount of money, it's because you know the loss represents everything that you've earned and everything that you've built and sometimes everything that you've dreamed for yourself and accomplished, and suddenly it's all gone, and you don't always get the help that you need to start over in the same place. 
Oh, without a doubt. I mean, we look, I mean, Puerto Rico is a good example. I mean, yeah. it was a year later before a power was uh, basically established to the entire island. Right. You know, so I mean, you look at a year, that, that's like an unbelievably long time for people to go without having power. You know, so it, it just, it, you look at each of these different tragedies that have happened and it just, um, yeah, I don't know, it's just, it's a little much. And that's why I'm so grateful we have your book, The Five Gifts, because it does help people to move through in their own way. You're they able to get some insights, some some assistance from your book and being able to walk through whatever is going on. We are coming up on the year anniversary of Parkland, and I know it's an anniversary none of us want to, you know, think about, but here we are. You know, the, um, the, the, there is a... There, there is research that shows that um, a big media presence can add a layer of trauma. And when a community um, has experienced, um, you know, especially where, where children are killed, you know, massive loss of life, but especially when it involves young people, and then there's the publicity attached. I mean, this happened with uh, 9-11 also, that um, the exposure, you know, so, some people... And um, you know, certainly the you know the the main five or seven kids from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas are exceptionally poised and confident and um, you know were able to kind of energize you know an entire movement. But uh, there is a time when when grief needs to be private, you know, for each and every one of us. And the the lack of privacy when there are cameras, when you know those of us who are not living in that community will be exposed to hours and hours of playback and footage and footage of the protests and footage and images of uh, the kids being escorted out of the school. And it's going to play over and over and over again this time of year. Um, it will be heartbreaking for people who are directly affected uh, by that particular tragedy. And I think, you know, because there is something called secondary trauma or vicarious traumatization, that those of us who are, you know, watch, uh, you know, look at news, uh, and I include myself as somebody who watches uh, the news for a couple of hours a day. I don't watch it all day, every day, but, you know, I do like to put in a couple of hours in the evening to be, you know, kind of well-informed. Um, the heart-wrenching emotions that are going to get triggered, the flood of emotions that will get triggered by watching those images uh, can cause each of us to have flashbacks, to feel helpless, uh, to feel frightened, to be startled. There's something that happens where, you know, somebody drops a cup, you know, in a, another corner of a restaurant and you feel like you're going to jump out of your skin. Um, those are, those are um, biological responses in the aftermath of something painful and traumatic that's happened. And I think that, you know, millions of us will be, will experience some kind of secondary trauma, just like when Dr. Christine uh, Blasey Ford was testifying. Um, many women, including Connie Chung, wrote about flashbacks to earlier abuse that suddenly you know, came up that they hadn't remembered you know, for many, many years. So the spontaneous uh, memories started to come back of these uh, painful incidents of uh, harassment and abuse for many, many, many women, including some women um, I had worked with over the years. And so, you know, there is something to be aware of as we, as we, as we are shown uh, video and we're shown images from the horrible events of Parkland a year ago. And that is that, that we really need to be kind and gentle with ourselves and stop watching if we, if we find that we're viscerally upset. Uh, because they we're normal people having normal reactions to a really horrifying situation, but there's a certain point where we need to really take care of ourselves so that we don't uh, give in to this sense of loss and heartbreak and helplessness. Yeah, I mean, because it, it is easy to get swept away with what's going on in the reporting and, and just take that internally. I mean, I felt it many times where it's like, gosh, feels like it's ripping my soul apart. It's horrible. It is. It is. And, you know, the fact that the, that the images are everywhere. I mean, you know, if you, um, you sit in a doctor's waiting room, you know, they've, they've got CNN on in the waiting, waiting room or in an airport or, um, you know, you see it on your cell phone or you see it on, you know, the person 
uh, sitting opposite you on the train or the bus, you know, and they're, they're watching it on their tablet. Um, it, it's very, very hard to tune it out. And I, I really recommend that, especially if we have an anniversary coming up that was a, a national trauma, I think, for every, everybody was affected by uh, the events of Parkland, that we, you know, give yourself a news break, you know, it's, you know, turn it off for 24 to 48 hours and, and do something for a few minutes a day that makes you smile. You know, try to find mm-hmm. something that feeds your soul and, um, you know, focus on that, uh, because the, the heartache, you know, it, it is a genuine reaction, but we don't need to keep, you know, being visually reminded of, uh, of events that are going to possibly cause us to to become depressed or to feel anxious because there's there, there's already an epidemic of anxiety right now and the anxiety levels are up i think it's 47 percent over 2017 that's how mm. uncertain and unsettled um the turbulence in the atmosphere has become both you know the natural you know the environmental atmosphere political atmosphere financial atmosphere um, and the the general psychological climate is very very unsteady right now. So turn it off and do something that helps you to feel centered, even for a few minutes, and it will really help. Yeah, because I mean, there's there's just so much of that out there, and it's like you have to kind of guard yourself in some ways. It's not to be unaware of what's happening, but really kind of guard yourself in what is is what you allow in because it, it can get overwhelming and it can get overwhelming. And then when, it, when, when you feel overwhelmed, then you, you don't really have your, your best self available, you know, for, for mm-hmm. uh, whatever it is that you like to do or whatever it is that you need to do. So self care is really, really critical at this point. I have um, in the book, I have some uh, techniques that I call emotional first aid uh, exercises uh, they they work very very quickly. Sometimes it's as simple as noticing where in your body you're you're feeling overwhelmed or upset, and kind of tuning in and breathing in a soothing color, and let that color find its way. Whether it's you know not in your stomach or whether it's um, you know tension at the back of your neck, and just let that color kind of find its way and start to bring comfort and release tension. And then as you exhale, you can let go of anything that you don't want to feel by breathing out a different color. And you do that for a few cycles of breath and um, you'll find that your shoulders drop and suddenly you release a deep sigh and you kind of go, ah, and you you, you feel um, a little bit safer in your own skin. And I think that's the overall goal of the five gifts is, is to help people uh, feel safer in their own skin after these life-shattering events. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Because it really is about being able to, cause we're going to have these tragedies. They're going to keep happening, unfortunately, um, in our country, both environmentally and man-made. And so we have to look at this in, in a, another light. And your book really helps, your book, The Five Gifts, really helps people to walk through what's going on. And thank you very much. And, and I hope that the book offers people a roadmap. And I, I know um, in, in speaking to, to people who, um, you know, have uh, either, yeah, basically have survived, you know, some of these mass shooting events over the last year. Mm-hmm. And they say that, you know, that they find the book is very helpful because it, it kind of helps them to see kind of, it's not that, that every everybody doesn't follow this. It's not like a linear process. But it helps mm-hmm. people to understand that maybe six months later, a year later, maybe even after the first anniversary, uh, that the responses that you're having might be unexpected. You might think, oh, well, I should be over it by now. It's the first anniversary. You know, there's all this media hype and there are going to be all these rituals and people are going to talk about closure and then you wake up the next day. And sometimes that's when the grieving really starts because you've been surviving in a state of shock for the first year. So it kind of helps to offer, I think, a psychological roadmap so that people can be more understanding and accepting of w- wherever it is they are in their journey. Mm-hmm. It, it really is a, um, a roadmap. I really thought your book was not only very well written, but it provides so much insight, so much 
uh, where people can take it and really improve their life wherever they're at, wherever they're going through. Um, I think I have time for one more question. I, I know in the five gifts you talk about reframing a tragedy, reframing crisis. What does that mean and why would we do that? Well, we, reframing um, is, is, a, is a kind of clinical term that really helps us to find something positive in a horrifying situation. So to be able to, to say, okay, I would never, when we look at the gift of growth, you know, the, the final gift, uh, as I call it, is the, the gift of growth. It's when we're able to look back at what happened and say, you know, I wish I had never gone through this. And I certainly would never wish it on anybody. But if I hadn't gone through it, I would never have learned what I learned. And I wouldn't be who I am today. And um, I'm definitely stronger and I'm more empathetic and I'm more resilient. And, um, you know, I have more to give to others and to myself. Or, you know, I would never have taken the career path that I've taken for some people. It's a wake-up call. It's a catalyst to kind of go into some kind of a service career or to be able to help other people who are going through tragedies. You find a lot of uh, grassroots uh, support organizations and communities uh, like my hometown of Long Beach, New York, uh, where we do a lot of outreach and collecting donations whenever there's a hurricane or a tornado in another part of the country. So I think that's what I mean by reframing is is looking for what what can I be learning? You know, what is this showing me about myself and my ability to respond uh, both in the present and in the future as a result of what I've had to go through. Yeah. Well, that is, I think, a, a good note to kind of end on today because we could talk forever. I mean, you're, you have so much wisdom and insight in your thank book, you. The Five Gifts. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Where could our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? Well, thank you for asking. Um, I am on Twitter at Dr. Lori, um, on Instagram at Lori Nadell, and I'm not on Facebook, but there is a Five Gifts page, uh, also on LinkedIn. But, you know, there are links to the social media um, on my website, which is my name, com, L-A-U-R-I-E-N-A-D-E-L.com. Or you can call me, and I, I really think it's very important for us to speak to each other as much as possible. My phone number is 212-560-2333. It's 212-560-2333. Well, do you know, Lori, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, and, and it's really my honor. Thank you so much for your interest in the five gifts and, and in the work. Well, thank you, Dr. Lori. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Five Gifts, Discovering Hope, Healing, and Strength When Disaster Strikes. The Five Gifts is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.